more and more people are using a TV as a PC monitor these days, which is why we have reviewed the LG C10 OLED last year as such, so that we can see how it stacks up against traditional desktop monitors. In this video, we're going to review the newer 48-inch LG C1 OLED to see how it performs so that you can decide whether you should consider using an OLED TV as a monitor. Hi, I'm Kelsey at TestOurRatings.com, where we help you find the best product for your needs. We bought the 48-inch LG C1 OLED to test, but it's also available in larger sizes, from 55 to 83 inches. We expect the larger sizes to have very similar picture quality, but of course the pixel density goes down the bigger the screen is. One thing to note is that if you've already seen our TV review of the C1, just know that our testing methodologies for TVs and monitors are different. So the scores aren't comparable. All right, let's get to the design. Overall, not much has changed from the C10 OLED. You still get thin bezels, the center mounted stand, and there's still this horizontal texture on the back. Most of the inputs are side facing and you have cable management through the stand. Of course, because this is a TV, there are no ergonomic adjustments. So what you see is what you get. You can VESA mount it, and for that you need a 300 by 200 mount. The overall build quality is outstanding. Not much has changed there. It's a mix of metal and plastic. The screen doesn't flex and the stand is very stable. To know more about the inputs, stick around for the input section later in the video. Before we talk about the individual test results, let's just do a quick overview of the C1. Basically, it's an OLED TV that we're testing as a PC monitor. It gives you tons of space for work and gaming, and it has amazing picture quality. It's best suited for a dark to moderately lit room. Also, it's meant to be viewed from a farther distance than a typical monitor because the pixel density is a bit low at this screen size. You get full sRGB coverage and wide gamut support with 91% DCI-P3 coverage. Motion handling is amazing because it has 120 Hz refresh rate and near instantaneous response time. And you also get variable refresh rate support. And lastly, the stand doesn't allow for any ergonomic adjustments and there's a risk of permanent burn-in over time. Now let's move on to picture quality. We'll be comparing it to the C10 OLED because it's the direct predecessor. For an updated comparison with other monitors that we've tested, see the review page on our website, which is linked below. The first thing that we notice right away is the sheer size of the screen. The 48 inch model is the smallest one, but even at this size, the pixel density is not that great. It's 92 pixels per inch, which is about the same as a 24 inch 1080p display. This means that you'll likely be able to see individual pixels when up close, so it's best to sit a little farther back. It'll also help with neck strain because a lot of people have said that they experience neck pain from being too close to the screen. It can display Chroma 444 and text clarity is pretty decent overall, but you might still have some issues in some applications and that's because OLED panels typically have a WBGR subpixel layout. In terms of room suitability, Obviously, this is an OLED with a near-infinite contrast ratio, so it's about as good as it gets for dark rooms. Since there's no backlight, you won't get any backlight bleed or IPS glow. Blacks look deep and inky, and black uniformity is perfect because the pixels can turn off completely. For bright rooms, on the other hand, that's a different story. The screen can get relatively bright, at least enough for most lighting conditions. The bigger issue is the automatic brightness limiter in PC mode. The ABL makes the brightness more consistent across different scenes, but limits it to around 210 nits in most scenes. And it's even dimmer when the whole screen is lit, which you can see in the 100% window result. It's about the same as a C10. The only reason why it's different in our written reviews is that we use different picture modes for testing. The C1 can get just as bright in expert darkroom picture mode, but that comes at a cost of higher input latency. So we expect most people will use the game optimizer mode. The reflection handling is outstanding, but you might still have problems with direct reflections, which you can see in the photo here. As for viewing angles, they're outstanding as well, both horizontally and vertically. It's a slight improvement over the C10 from last year because colors don't shift as quickly when you move off center. This means that you'll get an accurate image at almost any angle, whether it's from the side, above or below. 
The color gamut in SDR is excellent. You get near full sRGB coverage and the calibration is decent out of the box. Most colors are a bit oversaturated because it's targeting a wider color gamut and color temperature is slightly on the cooler side. The gamma is almost exactly like the C10 where most darker scenes appear too dark and bright scenes are too bright. The Adobe RGB coverage is good, but it might not be good enough for photography professionals. Of course, this being a high-end TV, it supports a wide color gamut for HDR. The DCI-P3 coverage is outstanding at 91%. That's the color gamut used in most HDR content, and wider Rec 2020 coverage is decent. For the color volume, it doesn't have any problem in sRGB, because it essentially has 100% coverage, which means it can display all colors at different luminance levels. However, the volume in HDR is only okay, and that's mainly because of the screen brightness, so it struggles to display those really bright colors in HDR. Speaking of the HDR brightness, it's good. It gets pretty bright overall at 714 nits in real scenes, which is a big improvement over the C10's 571 nits, but it also has an aggressive automatic brightness limiter, so the image dims as the window size increases. Gradient handling is fantastic. There's only a little bit of banding in the darker shades. We did measure a tiny amount of color bleed, but that's not really noticeable in most content. Okay, the last thing to touch on before we talk about response time is the unavoidable subject of image retention. We do see some image retention after displaying a high contrast image for 10 minutes, but that disappears quickly within a minute or two. The more important issue is permanent burn-in, which can happen to all OLEDs. This is particularly important for PC use because many user interface elements stay on the screen for a long time. That being said, it shouldn't be a problem if you watch very content and take some preventative measures, like not leaving the screen on all day with the same image displayed, auto hide the taskbar, or have a screensaver that activates after a few minutes of inactivity. Let's move on to motion handling. OLEDs generally have a near instantaneous response time, and that's definitely the case here. Fast moving content looks clear with almost no blur trail at all. What's different about the C1 compared to traditional desktop monitors is that there are no overdrive settings. The response time is slower than the C10 at 60Hz when transitioning from full black to a bright color, but that's hardly noticeable. If you're sensitive to flickering, there's good news. OLEDs aren't technically flicker free, but they don't use pulse width modulation either, or PWM. On OLEDs, there's just a slight dip in brightness at every frame change, which is not visible to most people. But you can make the image flicker to reduce motion blur with black frame insertion feature. Just keep in mind that it can only flicker at 60 or 120 Hertz and it reduces the overall screen brightness. Just like the C10, it has 120 Hertz refresh rate, which feels a lot more responsive than 60 Hertz panel. And it supports variable refresh rate to reduce screen tearing. That includes HDMI form VRR, FreeSync and G-Sync compatibility. While we're on the subject of responsiveness, the input lag is actually lower than on the C10 likely because LG introduced the prevent input lag feature, which shaves off roughly two to three milliseconds of latency. For inputs, we have four HDMI 2.1 ports, three USBs, a 3.5 millimeter analog audio out, an optical digital audio out, a coaxial and an ethernet port. EARC is on HDMI 2 if you want to plug in an external home theater system. One thing that you'll notice is that there's no display port, which is pretty normal for TVs. This means you can only achieve 4K at 120Hz with a graphics card that has an HDMI 2.1 port. In terms of extra features, this is a TV, so you get smart features, a remote with voice control, and other features like motion interpolation. So overall, should you consider the LG C1 as a monitor? It's excellent for most uses, but there are a few things that you need to consider. First, the stand is fixed, so you can adjust the position unless you move the entire TV. Second, the SDR peak brightness is on the low side, which means that glare might be a problem if you're in a fairly bright setting. Third, there's a risk of permanent burn-in. If none of those things bother you, then it could be a good fit for you. Compared to its direct predecessor, the C10, 
it's a slight upgrade when it comes to viewing angles. But the most notable improvement has to be the HDR brightness. Other than that, they're almost identical. So that's it. What do you think of the LG C1 as a monitor? You can check out all of the measurements on our website. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel. You can also become an insider on the website for early access to our latest results. Thank you for watching and see you next time.